All right, so what we're looking at now is constructing truth tables for equivalent statement, or sorry, for um, compound statements. Where this differs from what we've done so far is in the examples we looked at previously, these guys here. We were working out truth values for specific statements or statements where we knew the truth values ahead of time. And like we said, the truth table for these compound statements is overkill because the truth value can be obtained from just one row of that table, making the other rows unnecessary for that one example. However, if we want to fully analyze a compound statement, meaning you know consider all possible combinations of truth values for P and Q or P, Q and R, depending on what we have, um, then we need to go through a truth table to get all possible combinations. So uh, I'm actually going to say that in chapter three, this is probably the thing that you're going to be doing the most is constructing these truth tables. Um, in the next couple of sections, we're going to introduce new logical connectives, and we're going to do a lot of this with those connectives as well, making truth tables. So let's talk about um, this compound statement right here. This is a fairly simple looking one, not P and Q. How do you construct a truth table for this? Well. Um, we have two component statements, P and Q. Each of those will need their own column. Now, the next thing you want to do is if any negations show up in your compound statement, you want those negations to be uh, what come next. So not P. I'm going to need a column for not P. And that's going to that's going to be the only negation because I don't see a not Q showing up anywhere. Finally, we want to build up to our compound statement, which is not P and Q. So we're making a table out of this, four columns this time. Okay. Now again, remember, we want to consider all possible combinations of truth values for P and Q. And what we've seen <coughs> in the truth tables we looked at at the beginning of the last video is that if you have two component statements, you'll end up with four rows in your truth table. A little bit later, we'll talk about a rule for determining how many rows your truth table will have, depending on how many component statements you have. So what were those four rows? Well, we're only working with these first two columns here. P and Q can both be true. P can be true and Q can be false. P can be false and Q can be true, or they can both be false. Those are the only four combinations of truth values for those two statements. Now, this column is the column for not P. Notice it only depends on the truth value of P. So I'm going to use this first column to determine what the truth values in this third column are equal to. Remember that the negation of P will always have an opposite truth value as P. So where P is true, these first two rows, not P will be false. Where P is false, the last two rows, not P is going to be true. Okay, now let's look at our compound statement in this fourth and final row. It's a conjunction, not P and Q. Remember what it takes for a conjunction to be true. It can only ever be true if both statements that you're forming the conjunction from are also true. And notice that both of these statements, not P and Q, correspond to the third and second columns, respectively. So I'm actually not even looking at my first column anymore. I want to think about what's true, uh, what the truth value of not P is, which is this column, and Q, which is this column. So comparing these two um, in the first row, are both of those statements true? No. One of them happens to be false, which means the conjunction, the conjunction will be false. Next row. Are both of them true? No. In this case, they're both false. So I'm going to have a false in that case as well. Third row, are both of these true? Yes. So the conjunction will be true. Last row, are they both true? No. One of them is false, so we end up with false again. Okay? This would be the truth table for this compound statement. And again, notice the more connectives that you have showing up in this uh, in, this com in this compound statement, the more columns that we have to think about because we build up to the overall compound statement. Here's another example. It's a little bit more involved. 
we want to construct a truth table for this statement, p and q or not q. Notice in this one, the component statement q shows up in two different places, but it still represents the same statement. Whatever q is, it's the same statement that's being used here and here. So we still only have two uh, component statements, which means I still need my first two columns to just be p and q. Next up, I want to see if there's any negations that I need to write um, for my next column. And I have one, not Q. So that's going to make the third column in my truth table. Okay. Now I'm actually not ready to build all the way up to my components, uh, my entire compound statement here, because I see there's something showing up in parentheses. And things that show up in parentheses should also get their own column. So P and Q should get its own column, okay? Finally, um, I have the thing in parentheses. I have my negation over here. I can put everything together into a, into a final column, P and Q or not Q. So this is going to be my truth table. I actually don't need my columns to be quite that long, but that's okay. So again, with only two component statements, there are only uh, four combinations of truth values. True, 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 false, false, true, false, false. All right, what do we do with the negation? Well, this time the negation is on the Q statement. And again, negations will always have the opposite truth value as the statement they are negating. So if Q is true, this will be false. False here means true here. True here means false here. False here means true here. Okay, so this would represent the negation of Q. Next up, P and Q. What is the column gonna look like here? Well, notice that the component statements, P and Q, correspond to the first two columns in my truth table. So I'm not using my third column to determine my fourth column. We'll use the third column at the very end. Um, P and Q, because it's a conjunction, it can only be true if both component statements are true, which happens in the first row. P and Q are both true there. That's where this would be true. In the other three rows, we have at least one statement that's false. Conjunctions will be false if one of their component statements is false. And so that's what we end up with there. Okay. Now, <clears throat> um, what's this last statement? Well, even though it looks complicated, we've evaluated or analyzed the uh, stuff in parentheses and the negation here, which really means we're just looking at one statement and another statement put together by a disjunction. These two statements correspond to columns three and four. And remember, disjunctions will be true anytime at least one of the component statements are true. Notice in the first row, this component statement, which corresponds to the stuff in parentheses, is true, so our disjunction is true. In the second row, we have a true here under the not Q column, so that implies that the disjunction is true. In my third row, both component statements are false, so the disjunction is false. And in the fourth row, not Q is true, making the disjunction true. That would be our truth table in that case, okay? Really, it just takes a couple of examples to start getting the, the hang of this, but these compound statements can get a little complicated, so it's it's helpful to see what happens when we have to break things out into you know several different cases. So here's one that's gonna end up being more complicated for a couple of reasons. First of all, we have three component statements. We have a P, a Q, and an R in this case. This is going to end up giving us eight rows instead of four which we'll see by looking at all possible combinations. Not only that, it just in general, it looks like there's a lot going on. There's two sets of uh, uh, parentheses here that we have to consider. Um, it's just, it's a little messier looking. So let's think through this. Um, I need a column for my P, my Q, and my R now. All three of those get their own column. Next step, remember we look for any negations. I see one negation here. I see a not Q. So I'm gonna make a column for that, not Q. That's the only negation that I see, so we can move on. Um, next up, I need anything that appears in parentheses to get its own column. So P or R. 
gets its own column. Not Q and R gets its own column. Oop. And R. That takes care of all negations. That takes care of all parentheses. Now let's put them together with this disjunction to get the entire compound statement. P or R or not Q and R. Okay? And we make these columns here. Notice this one is definitely our most involved example so far. Okay. Now I had said before there's a total of uh, yeah, there's a total of um, eight rows. We're going to see why in a second. What I want to do is consider all possible cases where p could be true. So if p is true, then q and r can both be true. If p is true, then q can be true and r can be false. If p is true, q can be false and r can be true. If p is true, then q and r can both be false. Notice if I ignore this column, then the second and third column in my table look like the same uh, order in their truth values as the p and q columns from my previous examples. I've exhausted all possible uh, combinations of truth values for q and r just in, in these two columns. But each of these had a truth value of true corresponding to p. We haven't considered yet what happens if p is false. Well, that's going to lead to another four cases where I get these truth values for q and r repeated. True, 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 false, false, true, false, false. Okay? Now, what about this fourth column? Well, this is the not q column. So I'm comparing this column to my q column and I use the opposite truth value that I see happening for q. So the first two here are true, that means these will be false. Then I have a couple of falses, giving me a couple of trues here. Two trues corresponding to two falses, false, false, true, true. Okay, this one looks a little sketchy, that's a true. All right, next column, the fifth column, P or R. I look at the uh, component statements. P and R would correspond to the first and third columns. And the or, the disjunction, will be true anytime at least one of those statements is true. So notice in the first four cases, the way we structured this, P is true in all four of those. That means it won't matter what R is, we're guaranteed to have true as our first four uh, truth values in that column. Next up, P for the last four is always false. So that means if we want this disjunction to be true, we're going to need R to be true for that to happen in these last four cases. That only happens in this row and this row. So that means we have true, false, true, false. Okay, we're getting there. Not Q and R. Which two columns are we comparing this time? Well, here's not Q, here's R. We're comparing columns three and four. Those correspond to these component statements. And this time we have a conjunction. Both statements need to be true in order for this to be true. Does that happen here? No, we have a false. So that makes this false. We have falses here. Here we have a true and a true, making the conjunction true. Here we have a false, so this will come out false. Here we have a false, that's false. A couple of falses gives me false. Two trues gives me a true. There's a false that gives me a false, okay? Finally, we are doing the, uh, the large um, compound statement that we were given to begin with. And again, you think it, what we're doing is we're taking two sets of statements in parentheses and joining them by a disjunction. Do we have columns corresponding to the stuff in these parentheses? Yes, the previous two columns correspond to P or R and uh, not Q and R. With disjunctions, we're looking for um, only or at least one of the statements being true for the overall statement to be true. So notice in these first one, two, three, four, five statements, P 
P or R is a true statement in all five of those. So the first five truth values here are going to be true. Next up, we have a false false. For disjunctions, that would come out false. Then a true true, so we have a true, and a false false, we have a false. Okay, so in this case, uh, we have our truth table, and it looks like this particular statement is going to be true most of the time. Again, if we consider all of these cases to be equally likely. All right, so we've been kind of noticing some patterns here in the number of rows, and I keep talking about it, but um, we wanna make this like an official theorem or a rule. Um, let's take a look at some of the previous examples we've looked at. Uh, so in this case, we had two component statements, P and Q. And we had a total of four rows in our statement, or in our, um, uh, in our table, four rows. Okay, here in this example, I only had one component statement, P. And in this case, I ended up with two rows, one row, two row. Um, the example that we just did, we had uh, three component statements, P, Q, and R, and we ended up with, and you can count them, a total of eight rows. Is there a pattern here? Well, if you uh, recognize, you know, some like powers of two, for example, two to the first power is equal to two. Two to the second power, two squared, that's equal to four. And two to the third power is equal to eight. Two cubed is equal to eight. Notice that the exponents in each of these cases correspond to the number of component statements that the, the, that the compound statement had. One component statement gave me two to the one power number of rows. Two component statements gave me two to the second power number of rows. Three component statements gave me two to the third power number of rows. This generalizes, and we can prove it, but we're not gonna prove it here, to a, a nice general rule, which is this. A logical statement having n component statements. We looked at the cases of n equals one, two, and three, but if n is any positive integer, um, if that's the number of component statements that we have, then there's going to be a total of two to the n rows in its truth table. That's exponential in, in how that grows, the more uh, component statements that you add. So that means if you're looking for a uh, truth table for a compound statement having, say, 10, uh, 10 co uh, component statements in it, that's going to be 2 to the 10th power number of rows. That is a lot of rows. It's preferable to not have to make truth tables for things that are that large, so we're not going to look at really anything more than compound statements having three component statements like what we have here because really I mean this is big enough okay so one last thing we want to look at to wrap up this section is this idea of equivalent statements um, it turns out that there's a lot of statements that we can represent in symbolic form like this which may look different in symbolic form but have um, essentially identical truth values corresponding to the truth values of their component statements. In that sense, the two statements, even though symbolically they look different, would be considered the same. Um, if one statement is true, then the other one will be true. If one statement is false, then the other will be false. So in that case, we call those equivalent statements, and we can write, for example, if P and Q are two equivalent statements, we can write P equals two. So that's kind of making sense of that equals sign in this context of symbolic logic. Um, how do we prove that two statements are equivalent? Well, we do that by comparing truth tables. So to wrap this up, let's do one example where we're doing exactly that. We want to show that these two compound statements are equal or are equivalent, not P and not Q. We want that to we want to show that that's equivalent to not P or Q. Okay? So we need two separate truth tables here. Um, or we, oh, I'm going to show that we can actually get away without having to do two separate ones. But let's think about this for a second. Actually, we'll, we'll, we'll go the whole way and do the two separate ones. Um, let's start with the statement, uh, not P 
and not Q. I want to compare that statement to this one. So I'm going to construct a truth table for this. P and Q are my component statements. Those each get their own column. Each one has a negation that shows up. So I need a not P and I need a not Q. And then finally, they're joined by a conjunction, not P and not Q. So my first truth table will look like this. My second truth table is related. I have a P and a Q showing up as my component statements, so each of those needs a column. Neither the P nor the Q is negated on their own, but this disjunction is going to get a negation applied to it. Now here's one case where we don't want to deal with the negation first. Things in parentheses always come first. So I need to do P or Q before I can deal with not P or Q. Okay, so here's what my truth table is going to look like for that second statement. Now what I'm going to do is uh, do what we've done for, for truth tables. Find all possible combinations. So that's true, 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 false, false, true, false, false. And then fill out the columns. So again, negations should look the opposite as the statement they're negating. True, true, false, false. This will come out to false, false, true, true. For not Q, true, false, true, false comes out to false, true, false, false true after negating. These two statements, not P and not Q, correspond to the two columns we just filled out, and we are forming a conjunction out of those. Remember, conjunctions are only ever true as long as both statements are simultaneously true. Comparing these two previous columns, we see that that only happens in the very last row. All of the first three rows have at least one false component statement, and so those three will be false. Now let's look at this. Again, P and Q are going to look identical to what they look like over here. True, 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 false, false, true, false, false. Okay, we're forming a disjunction out of those P or Q. So in that case, remember disjunctions are, all, are always true as long as one, at least one of their component statements is true. And that occurs in the first three cases, but not in the last case, all right? So true, 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 false. Now this final column is taking the previous column, P or Q, and negating that entire thing. So that's the same as negating each of these truth values. True, 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 false becomes false, 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 true. Now if you notice, the final columns in each of these truth tables are identical. They both look like false, 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 true. And those, those truth values correspond to the same combinations of truth values for P and Q. So in both cases, if P and Q are both true, then both of the compound statements will be false. Or if uh, P is false and Q is true, then in both cases the compound statements will be false. And you can verify that for all possible combinations because we did the truth tables. So what that means is that these two statements are equivalent to each other. All right. Now this is one of two important laws that we call De Morgan's laws. That should sound familiar because we talked about De Morgan's laws in the set theory chapter back in chapter two. And they should look very, very similar. The difference here is that instead of complements like what we used in set theory, we're using negations. And if you think about it, those two, those two uh, concepts are very similar. They, they should feel very related. Um, also, instead of using intersections and unions, we're looking at conjunctions and disjunctions. Those concepts are actually related as well. In fact, if you remember, when we talked about um, you know, what it means to take the union of two sets, union of, uh, or the union of sets A and B is the set of all elements that are in A or B. See how the word or shows up when we're describing a union. That same word or is one of our logical connectives. So there is connections between De Morgan's laws here and what we were calling De Morgan's laws back in the set theory chapter. Um, we're not going to prove these. We've proved one of them up here. The other one is a good exercise to do. I think the book actually works out the other one. Um, but uh, that's going to wrap it up for 3.2.